I'm well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Lewis Elliott. Yeah, thanks so, for having me. Oh, my my pleasure. So so we spoke last week about um uh the the importance of the, the Haitian Revolution and what it did in the the, the, con the contemporary consciousness of uh of racism. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I thought it'd be a good idea to sort of discuss the, the, the history of this um, as well as sort of before what had happened and, and the events leading after this. Now, for, for those just tuning in, um, do you mind telling us a little bit about your background and, and the history that, that you teach and why you got into it? Yeah, of course. So I, um, I was born and raised in, in London, England, um, but my I was raised by a single mother. Um, my mother came from Cape Town, uh, South Africa, and she uh, was forced to leave her homeland because she contravened uh, the apartheid regime in the 1970s. Uh, and so, uh, you know, raising me and my siblings with a very conscious focus on, um, you know, racial difference and and the power of, of racism in society, what that can do uh, to a community. Uh, and I, so I grew, grew up in South London in a place called Brixton, which is in Southwest London. And it is known for a very large population of people of Caribbean descent. Uh, so my professional interests are in, uh, in the Caribbean, the Caribbean, uh, the African diaspora in the Caribbean. Uh, and my, my research uh, looks at enslaved rebellions and the ways that um, people of African descent through the act of rebellion influenced uh, the ideologies of the time and then how we see that influence projected into the present. Right. And, 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 and uh, now is that, is that me that's picking up that echo? I, you're fine on my end. Okay. I'm going to look at, look at my stuff here and see if there's a reason why. Because I was getting a bit of a, a verberation. Okay. So, oh, so a few people could hear it as well. Maybe I'm just too close or something to the figuring out the whole Zoom distance thing, the social distancing from my own <laughs> mic. Um, so, and we were talking about the Haitian Revolution and how, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is, a turning point in history because chattel slavery, um, it, it really started sort of when shortly after Christopher Columbus uh, discovered the new world and colonization started to become a thing. Yeah. So chattel slavery and it's in the form that we know it from that period, from the you know late 1700s, uh, really began soon after uh, Columbus arrived in the Americas. Um, there, there were forms of slavery being explored and forms of slave trading being explored, especially among uh, the Portuguese um, just slightly before that, um, as they, they began exploring uh, and um, developing relationships with coastal African states uh, in West Africa. But the, yes, you're right, the slavery that we we witnessed in Haiti and the slavery that those Haitian rebels were rebelling against uh, began soon after uh, Columbus arrived early 1500s when it became clear that there were commodities to be extracted from the Americas uh, and commodities to be grown and then uh, exported to Europe. Right. right. And another thing that we, uh, we discussed was how slavery before this period, it did exist but not to the, the industrial size that it became. And you, we, we had talked earlier that mm -hmm. there were slaves from all over different ethnicities and backgrounds before this period, but it wasn't until the Portuguese made these trading connections with Western Africa that, that this, the, the industry of slavery really took hold and, and manifested itself in the Middle Passage. Right, exactly. So slavery, slavery has been part of, you know, practically every civilization uh, in history. That's, that's well established. Uh, and I think that 
you're right, Rob. The, the difference, the central difference, is that industrialization yes. of slavery yes. that, that occurred as a response to that commodification of American goods. Um, so slavery existed uh, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, and, you know, throughout most of Europe, but certainly in its earlier history, but usually as a form of punishment. Um, it was a, a, a limited term prison sentence, you know, equ an equivalent could be hard labor. Um, it was a, um, a result of war. Uh, the, 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 the losing side in battle might uh, have some of their soldiers enslaved to ensure uh, there was no, would be no repeat. Uh, but these were temporary things and they were uh, on a far smaller scale than we've ever seen in history. Uh, the, the rise of chattel slavery is the, the term that you used, it's the accepted term, industrial slavery is another way of looking at it, is, is slavery on a scale that had never been seen, but seen before. Uh, it, it was absolutely massive and it was spearheaded by the Portuguese uh, and then the, the French, Spanish and English uh, soon after to um, populate their uh, colonies, uh, populate the colonial plantations in order to extract maximum wealth uh, from those areas. Uh, and that's what, um, 80 was the, the most profitable um, at the time of its revolution. Um, the French were uh, growing incredibly wealthy off the backs of their African laborers in Haiti. Uh, and it was the massive economic importance to the French empire. Um, that meant that when uh, when they they lost that, uh, lost that colony, uh, it, the, the reverberations were just massive throughout the Atlantic world. Well, and it's, it's almost like it was twofold. So now I, I I am still picking that up by I'm just wondering by any chance, do you do you have headphones? I do not, I'm afraid. Uh, okay. nothing that will work for this. No, no problem. I I don't know why it keeps doing that on my end, but it seems to be better now. So yeah. The, the, the problem with this is that it was twofold. It affected um, not only France's uh, view to the other colonial powers. So other colonial powers wanted Haiti. So they see that there's this vacuum. And, and Haiti was, like you said, it was the richest colony for France. It was the most wealth uh, uh, generating of the <clears throat> colonies. But also, too, that slavery... Um, again, this industrial slavery was all throughout the Americas from Brazil to um, um, North America. So when this happened, there was great fear of these empires that this could happen to them. So they, they doubled down on, on their, their restrictions, their security. Is that right? Yeah. They, so they did, there was a, there was a massive fear that uh, events in Haiti would be repeated uh, elsewhere. It didn't necessarily lead to a, a change in attitude uh, in terms of uh, policies on the ground um, in, in political terms. Uh, there, there were significant concerns among individual planters uh, who grew further, more and more suspicious. Uh, and that manifested in their treatment of their en enslaved people, but there was no massive sort of reorientation of uh, colonial policy, uh, and that that was that was in large part why events in Haiti became so inspirational uh, among people of African descent, and led to uh, misinformation and, and led to inspiration. Uh, and triggered numerous other revolutions, uh, uh, revolts uh, against slavery, uh, and that is the that is the um, that is the what I'm most interested in. The ways that uh, the, the those the, those Haitian ideologies spread throughout the Caribbean, throughout the Americas, uh, really, and then how, despite that fear of of a Haitian revolution that um, that existed among those other imperial powers and, and national powers. Um, during the age of revolutions as, as the empires broke apart, um, how they were unable to, you know, by, while being concerned about what happened in Haiti, were then unable to respond uh, in a way that didn't, um, didn't cause uh, massive loss of life and chaos for both them and their enslaved people. 
what? And before, um, before this happened, we discussed how the slavery was viewed. I mean, slaveholders did not obviously treat their, they, they treated human beings as tools. And there were sort of two ways that they looked at it that, that we discussed that really kind of sets in motion, um, again, why this revolution, this slave revolt took place because of uh, one, that, that it was a, a very slim minority that were slaveholders. Like some slaveholders owned up to, uh, it's, it's some records say like two, 200 slaves, some crazy astronomical numbers. And the way that slaves are treated was completely dehumanizing. And I think you, you discussed it as there was the utility and there was the, the dehumanization. Yeah. So the, these are the two, um, you're right, right. The, these are the two processes that, that right. differentiate industrial slavery um, in Atlantic slavery from, from other forms of slavery in history. You have industrialization, um, which led to dehumanization and commodification. So these two things did not occur by accident. This was a, a specific and deliberate process uh, that um, these, these white imperial masters from Europe um, put in place uh, over the course of the Middle Passage, the, the passage from Africa to the Americas. That meant that by the time these uh, people of African descent, these, these African enslaved people arrived in the, Mer in the Americas, they were now ready uh, to work on plantations and the two things that were required was dehumanization it was the scale of slavery meant that um it would have been impossible to see these people as people right they were beasts and animals to to the uh enslavers uh, and then they were tools they were they were to be used until they were no longer up to the task and then they were to be discarded something one of those common misconceptions uh in the history of slavery and slavery studies uh, is the idea that paternalism uh, was a, a long-held belief, this idea that enslaved people were uh, treated um, with any degree of respect uh, and that um, enslavers were in any way interested in their welfare, um, their views on anything uh, and their place in the world uh, beyond work on their plantations. That was a, a very much 19th century attitude that occurred after the end of the transatlantic slave trade itself um, that that ended for the British in the in 1807 and for the United States in 1808 uh, and through most of Latin America um, up until the 1850s that was still going on the ready access to that uh, labor that enslaved labor coming over from Africa meant that there was no there was no reason to engage with enslaved people in any way other than as workers uh, as tools as, as you said right? uh, and that that colors revolutions and rebellions in a way that would be different uh right if, if that if that wasn't the case uh we talked briefly about you know nat turner which nat turner was in 1831 in, in virginia in the u.s and that was, you know, after the, the transatlantic slave trade to Virginia had been outlawed for, for over 20 years at this point. So most enslaved people, uh, given the shockingly low life expectancies, as you can imagine, would have been born in the U.S. Uh, and they would have experienced a very different kind of slavery to uh, those in Haiti in 1791, uh, where, you know, the, the slave trade from Africa was still very much alive and well. That's a different kind of slavery that led to different kinds of revolution uh, in the eyes of white people. And I think that's the really interesting point. The point that I really find fascinating is because Nat Turner in the 1830s, uh, the Malay rebels in Bahia in Brazil in 1835, the, um, the Amistad mutineers in 1839 in Cuba, uh, all had a very similar view as to what they were demanding. And that was, you know, independence and End of, an end of slavery, which is exactly what was going on in Haiti. And it was people, uh, it was white people, white slave owners and white politicians from these empires and nations that were unable to comprehend that this was, the, the, from the, the eyes of the enslaved, this was, uh, the, the problem was massive and essentially identical. 
uh, and that's what um, was so hard to comprehend for these white people uh, and led to these revolutions occurring the way that they did, that common wind, as it's called, from Haiti spreading throughout the Americas. Right. And uh, sorry, it's not that uh, reverberations that I'm getting that's uh, distracting here. So, um, the the other thing is this idea of paternalism, mm -hmm. uh, and this being birthed sort of around the time of abolition. You wrote about William Blake uh, and, and these ideas that are coming out about this time. The, the other piece is that what might be hard for, for others to understand is that, like I said, racism had a very different look. I mean, the Mediterranean was sort of, if you think about the Occidental histories of the world, Northern Africa was a resource to the rest of Europe. And so there would have been interactions with people of African descent, um, with Europeans, but it, but like you say, with Portugal going down there and then moving to Haiti, uh, or, or excuse me, to the colonial powers, that's when things changed. Now, the other piece about that is um, around 1791, when this all happens, the way the revolution took place is very different. So the backdrop to this is that there's the French Revolution, and that due to the French Revolution, uh the colonies realized that the motherland or, or, or their imperial owner, however you properly phrase that, was now bankrupt. So now is a good time to make demands for the changes that they wanted to see. Is that sort of the backdrop to the, the, the Haitian Revolution? Why this took place? Yeah, so that's a, a boat of contention. I'll, uh, let me address the, the North African thing sure. first. Uh, so you're absolutely right. North Africa was a massive resource for Europe, but then... Europe was a massive resource for North Africa as well. That relationship was very even, okay? And in the early days of, um, of contacts, the early days of the, the transatlantic slave trade, that relationship was quite even as well. It was the, the economic strength, the economic importance of the Americas. It was a, a, an economic boon that African states did not have access to, which quite quickly shifted that balance okay the the other slightly uncomfortable i suppose reality is that until about the 1840s europeans had no way into africa and so it was coastal african states places like the Ome and lagos uh, and, and congo who were profiting massively uh, and that money was uh, being concentrated on the coast and leading to massive power imbalances in Africa, which led to Europe becoming the more and more dominant partner. Okay, before that, uh, Africa, the, the, the wealth disparity in Africa was, was rather different, uh, and that meant that they were much more even in terms of, a, in, in global economic terms, a more even partner with European engagement until, um, uh, until the, uh, the advent of that industrial slavery. Uh, your point about Haiti being it being an opportune moment, uh, this is something that's quite contentious uh, among in, in the historical, you know, scholars of slavery uh, and, and scholars of Haiti in particular. And I, I am I'm a scholar of revolution more than I am a scholar of Haiti, um, but I, I I'm aware that there is this. I would call it looking from not the outside, but with one foot in that door only. I I see it as a bit of a chicken or the egg. Um, analysis because you have a you know 90 plus percent of the population of Haiti uh, or Saint Domingue as it was at the time was enslaved, uh, and then you have a tiny, mostly urban minority of white people, white French people, who were then split on class lines just like they were in the metropole in, in France itself. So when the French Revolution kicks off in the 1880s, you have that power disparity among white people in Haiti which leads to a, an incredibly fragile colonial relationship. Some people say that that was an opportune moment for enslaved people to then trigger a, a re revolution and that they were in tune with uh, what white discourses were going along in, in the uh, urban areas of Haiti. I, I think that the, the enslaved people were 
not so interested in those white discourses and were very much angling for a liberty of their own design rather than a liberty of a French Republican design and that they were really were desperate for emancipation. They, they wanted an end to slavery in, in Saint-Domingue. Um, the timing was was opportune and they were probably well aware of what was going on, but I wouldn't suggest that they were then siding with the Republican side, which some people have suggested. Uh, they they had their very much had their own uh, ideas about what they wanted out of um, the Haitian Revolution. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, organizing the slave revolution, mm -hmm. is there much primary sources on, on how this was done? Because I again, what I'd like to do is understand the how this reverberates echoes into mm -hmm. into today and and things like grassroots movements like the civil rights movements black lives matter movements mm -hmm. um in the face of, of of these oppressors how were they able to organize themselves uh and to become you know to to they had the numbers but they were able to overcome the powers they were and in terms of sources that there's a, a fair amount of inference um, to be done. You know, most people, you know, it wasn't a racial thing. Most people in the Caribbean were illiterate at the time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, they weren't writing things down. Um, but there were there were sufficient numbers of, of literate enslaved people that they were able to uh, steal newspapers. They were able to over, and then overhear gossip. Uh, from the, the plantation houses uh, and these things are are pretty well established as the the way that information was passed around uh, enslaved communities uh, the, the those reasons the 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 knowledge of the up, uprisings and the unrest in metropolitan France would have been well well established throughout the island of Haiti um, it might not be might not have been completely accurate um, they, they might have, um, you know, the, the game of telephone across the Atlantic and then between plantations would have certainly distorted them. Uh, I, you know, in my own research, I was um, recently looking at a, a rebellion in Jamaica um, that, uh, that happened in the 1830s, that, known as the Baptist War. And uh, the enslaved testimony from survivors uh, of that rebellion who were being, you know, interrogated by Imperial authorities, uh, Imperial British authorities, uh, they were talking about how they'd heard about what William Wilberforce had been saying. Uh, they were expecting the king to uh, end slavery, and they they believed that there was the plantation owners that were withholding uh, emancipation. Uh, and you know, it was probably nonsense. They were probably well aware that that wasn't the case, but that's a good story to spread around. Uh, it, it gets them off the hook because they 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 had knowledge before. You know, they, they're not. You know, they're not one dimensional. They're not. They don't have a one track mind. They were savvy and street smart and uh, and scrappy as well as being formidable in their numbers. So the, you know, it was an awareness that the power dynamic was a myth that really yeah. triggers the Haitian Revolution and triggers subsequent revolutions as well. Because you said you, one successful revolution leads to so many attempted revolutions uh, and rebellions and, and uprisings, uh, and it it is the the reasons why Haiti was successful were where you know so many others aren't. Those are debated so hotly as well, uh, and it, it's you know the timing of the French Revolution is important. Uh, the the personnel, the 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 people, the, the the individuals who were rebelling in Haiti were particularly gifted uh, military operators um as well um but the response of, of of whites was probably the the main thing uh the the the, the shock of, of this going well at first and then that snowballing into uh, a call for independence uh meant that the, the subsequent times that occurred um they were a little more wary and a little more aware of what, what was to come uh, and that was 
that was probably the the, the central difference, uh, along with you know the, the massive scale of it. The um, it was a bigger revolution that had ever occurred in the Caribbean or the Americas uh, until that point. And they also um, fought off the English, like other co colonial powers went into Haiti. And um, my apologies for the mispronunciation of his name, but the general that oversaw it, L'Overture? L'Overture, yeah. Yeah. And how he was able to mobilize his armies and defend against, like, because, because there was a racial hierarchy at the time, and still is, of course. And the fact that they kept being defeated, like they, they underestimated Haiti, obviously. Um, but then there was this idea of, is this sort of the genesis of, I guess, white fear around sort of minorities? Like, is this, is this where that kind of, this, the stereotype of um, the black aggressor comes from? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I would say there were probably instances of that earlier, but in terms of yeah. the mass, the mass hysteria about the people of African descent and the inherent danger that they they pose to to white society, uh, I would agree it, it probably has its genesis in in the in the seventeen nineties the, the Haitian Revolution. Um, I push back a bit on the suggestion that they underestimated Louverture. I think he defeated them he was they were well aware of him being um a, a threat and he was you know that the, uh, he's he should be and deserves to be listed among the great generals of history he, he was a genius a military absolute military genius um but you're right so the obviously the french were his primary target and in, in that that revolution the, the war for haitian independence that he was successful in defeating them other powers were quite interested in in what was going on in in haiti um you know as we discussed already it was the most profitable colony in the americas um it was the the loss of revenue that would hit france was going to be fascinating and potentially very useful for you know the the brinkmanship and saber rattling going on between the french and the spanish and the french and the english the british so both the spanish and the british were were very closely uh, monitoring the situation, as was the, the new nation of the United States, who had um, wrestled with the idea of ending slavery and ultimately decided not to in their own founding less than 20 years previously. So you have all three of these nations, uh, empires or nations, um, observing what was going on in, in Haiti. And at first, they were quite content with the idea of the French losing their their crown jewel uh, of their empire and once that became clear and they saw the longer term effects of this uh, they put, suddenly became very concerned that haiti might actually successfully gain their independence because the idea of a black republic in the americas was absolutely atrocious uh, the idea that people of african descent were able to organize a Community, organize a state and act as a nation was completely contrary to everything that they had been espousing and the whole reason for slavery persisting uh, as long as it had was the falsehood that that was not that they were incapable of doing so so suddenly you have the British uh, suddenly you know launching um, Continue, uh, you know, battalions and marine of Marines from Jamaica to try and stop the Haitians uh, from gaining independence. George Washington sends uh, soldiers down from the United States to try and do the same. And Spain attacked through uh, San Domingo, which is the, the other half of the island. Um, they they try and uh, invade through that border, and Toussaint Louverture and his successors uh, defeat all of them, uh, leading to that Black Republic. So that's the other side of the coin, right? You have the, the enslaved rebellions, which are terrifying because of the, um, the ability for black people to organize themselves against whites. And then you have the longer term issue of the, the terrifying nature of a black republic and, and what that means discursively to your program of enslavement after the fact. The other piece too is that um for you know slaveholders and and this 
contemporarily speaking, our society, we have benefited mm -hmm. off of the exploitation of others in order yep. to get to where we are. We, we all have privileges. I have more privileges than another individual just based on the historical fact. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason why Haiti is still so relevant and it's such a powerful message, again, it, it, it speaks to this idea of for, for, you know, the white, the, 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 the person with all the power, the fear of reprisal, because that is what happened too, is that after Haiti, it was, people still would not relinquish power. And we know that that was met with the same level of violence that it would have been met by, by anybody, any other power, but because it was um, people of African descent, it was demonized so much, so much more. Yeah. So you have this is this. There are two reasons for this, right? You have firstly the the economic concerns of losing your investment, your plantation, property, your yeah. yeah, your property, uh, both human and you know agricultural, because that the you know the profits were massive, the, but the the margins were razor thin. It was an extraordinary investment to own a plantation in the in the Americas. Uh, and the other, the other issue is you know fear of revenge, uh, and that was, you know, the, it was said quietly because it again undermined the notion that it was a humane endeavor and a an endeavor that w the African body was suited for. Uh, because if if those things were true, then why would people of African descent be vengeful? Uh, and and so this was said. It was never said overtly the same way that it would be economically ruinous to end slavery. The concern was that they are gonna murder us in our beds because we have treated them so atrociously for so long. And, and I think that they have a, the fear was real. And ironically, the the rebellions that I've studied, I've, I've, I've looked at dozens of them uh, in my work, the impetus was not revenge. There was no, there were obviously instances of black people murdering white people. But most of that occurred on the battlefield. It was what I, I would suggest. I, I'd submit that this is a legitimate casualty because it was a war. Uh, it was a soldier on soldier, despite the white people not seeing it that way at the time. But there was no, you know, running into the plantation houses and murdering these people in their beds. There were instances of that, but it was by no means the primary motivator. There were two things that those people, the people of African descent wanted. They wanted an end of slavery and they wanted independence from white rule. Uh, and they weren't that fussed about how they got those things. They were very clear that those things are what they wanted. And it was the subsequent dis distortion of that message uh, that has led to the, you know, I, I, I would say, I could say that, I do say that there is a direct correlation between the inequalities of today and the distortion of that simple message that occurred in the 19th century. In your, in your article, uh, Exaltations, Agonies, and Love, the Romantics, and the Haitian Revolution, I mean, that you speak about around the time of abolition that, that these ideas are starting to come into fruition. And I mentioned previously about William Blake, the very famous <laughs> artist and poet, how he had a humanitarian approach and how that was popular, this idea that, that white bodies and black bodies were equal, although the language was still very much, you know, quite uh, problematic. But anyway, yeah. this, this idea that, that there was... Uh, equality and equity in their bodies, right? But then the Haitian Revolution happened, and it's almost like the arguments that William Blake was trying to make for a humanitarian approach to abolition kind of went out the window, and abolition became, it manifested itself in a very different way. Yeah, so abolition had, the notion, this is the other sort of quite serious misconception about Slate in slavery studies, the idea that there had there was always a loud voice in white society against slavery that that did not exist uh, until uh, 
until probably the 1760s, uh, and even then it was a it wasn't a, a large number of people. The abolition really gathered pace. Um, my expertise in the British Empire, uh, but I know that there were abolitionist movements uh, elsewhere, and they all spoke to each other. It was a very international uh, debate going on about abolition. Um, they that that really began in the 1770s, 1780s, and the the principal argument in those uh, in that period, I'm talking people like Randall Sharp. Uh, and, and William Wilberforce, uh, Hannah More. The idea was, uh, as, as you say, Rob, that there was a, a humanitarian justification for this uh, and that given the opportunity, people of African descent would be able to integrate into what they saw as white society just as well uh, as uh, white people had. Um, you know, again, language is problematic, um, but the language was very, very progressive for the time. Um, so, you know, historically that, that it's commendable. But then when the Haitian Revolution sends shockwaves around throughout the Atlantic world, um, you know, it affects uh, race relations in Latin America, North America, Europe and, and coastal Africa are all the same. Suddenly that image, uh, it, it is a much harder, it's a much harder argument to sell given the, the tales of savagery which uh, the people were hearing about what happened in Haiti. And we know now that it was a legitimate war of independence with a, a professionally run army against an imperial power uh, and the, 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 the professionally run army to saint louis uh, military force was successful. But the stories they were hearing now, then was, you know, it was the, the naked Africans taking the, the cane machetes and running into the beds and slaughtering children and eating them. And, you know, real horror stories and to really paint the, the now nation of Haiti in, in as bad a light as possible. And suddenly it becomes impossible then to, to suggest that abolition was a, uh, a, had any humanitarian benefit at all. And that it's when the, the argument starts that, that slavery was necessary to both protect the white people from people of African descent, but also to protect people of African descent from themselves and their own savage natures. That's when abolition becomes economic because the expense that states incurred to protect plantations from a vengeful enslaved population, the argument was made that it was therefore too expensive and that a free, uh, a free labor society would require less imp in economic input from the state in order to be successful. If you're paying your laborers, then they might not, they, they probably won't try and kill you. It was, the, you know, it was a very simplified and facile way of saying it, but that was essentially the argument. The middle ground is struck in, in the early 1800s with the, the end of transatlantic slavery. The idea being that if you end transatlantic slavery, suddenly the enslaved people who are already in the Americas uh, become that much more valuable. And therefore you must then, as a slave owner, treat them rather better because it's not like they were easily replaceable because the the you know the, the funneling from Africa is no longer happening. And that was that was the British and the Americans who were really spearheaded that the French soon after in 1815. Uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish kept up their slave trading uh, far, far later. Um, they didn't they, they weren't buying into that argument. And that that has a whole host of of reasons why that we can get into if you want. Um, but when the slave trade ends uh, the idea is that suddenly enslaved people are treated better. Uh, and that's not the case. They were treated differently, um, but uh, they were certainly not treated better. The, the dehumanization was still very much there. The commodification was perhaps uh, changed rather. Um, but we, we can get into that if you want. Uh, but that, that was the, the sea change in, in abolition as a result of the Haitian Revolution was that the tales of savagery that came out of it. There's two sort of historical examples um, that that echo today. One of Malcolm X and it's sort of freedom through any means. And then there's the, the it, which is an oversimplification of what Malcolm X stood for. Yeah. And an oversimplification of Martin Luther King Jr. who was all for integration. Of course, as you've discussed, I mean, we are all very complicated, complex people. So 
trying to you know paint somebody with such a broad stroke is always problematic but these do seem like the big sort of ideas of there's integration or there's sort of freedom you know our 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 liberation mm -hmm. and haiti again is, is draws on this sort of freedom by any means and the the outcomes of that as you as we've discussed the stereotypical outcomes in the minds of of uh, the powers that may be is that well that just means violence and so today we we speak about black lives matter and there, there's been two waves of it in the last 10 years and the first one died seemed to have have um gone down in its in its uh progressive nature and then it came back and it's it's like you said it's it's started a whole host of of um social movements right mm -hmm. uh but but this idea of there's still this huge fear of what does this mean what does this mean and and i think in in the public's eye we've well i talked about last time the psychology of slavery mm -hmm. and how really the the consequences of this have impacted and influenced everybody and and i know that you know we shouldn't feel so bad for the the white people and it's not necessarily about you know feeling bad for them yeah. but it's the idea of the effect that it has had and it's how do we move forward from this yeah so i think the co-opting of social movements is, is not new and and i would you know you're right there were these two waves of uh in the last 10 years uh of of, of progressive racial movements the, the black lives matter movement but the you know the problems that they are raising they've been raising since last summer are the same problems uh that they've been Absolutely. experiencing for the last 10 years and and prior and it, it's it's quite dangerous um when when these sort of social movements gather speed at, at the level that they are because it leads to what i see as exactly what happened in the anti-slavery movement of the 19th century so when um when slavery ends uh, and you know i'm going to use the british em imperial example it's the one that i know best but there are similar things occurred in cuba and brazil and the us um when slavery ends, there is then a debate over the place of blackness in society. And while not all black people were enslaved, mm -hmm. the vast majority of them were, and the equation was blackness equals slavery for the vast majority of people observing them. When that disappears, there is a discourse about what, what it means to be black in the British Empire, what it means to be black in the Spanish Empire, what it means to be black in the United States. Uh, and the co-opting of the victory of abolition, the idea that, you know, the idea that Lincoln freed the slaves or Wilberforce freed the slaves, uh, rather than enslaved people had been struggling for so long and Lincoln res relented or Wilberforce and the, the British uh, government relented and finally did as they had been demanded, uh, means that abolition is a white victory. And if it's a white victory, suddenly you there there is a an ability for white people to dictate the place of blackness in society, rather than the ability for black people to suddenly have the power to integrate themselves into society. That is that is distorted, as you said, by the you know the civil rights movement is a good recent, relatively example of that distortion. You have the Malcolm X versus Martin Luther King debate, and you're right to simplify it. Um, Malcolm X was uh, separation and uh, black liberation by any means, and Martin Luther King was a more discursive and placed a lot of emphasis on the power of peaceful protest. That has been co-opted by people who, who see uh, Martin Luther King as a as peaceful and someone who would uh, not have supported the Black Lives Matter because of the the violent elements of it, which is frankly nonsense. He would have, he would have not 
he would have not liked the violent aspects of it, but he would have been far more enamored with its message than with anything that he might have found distasteful. And the, the recasting of Martin Luther King as someone that delivered or someone that allowed Lyndon Johnson to deliver civil rights in a way that was palatable for white people has completely demolished what he actually stood for, which was which was integration. It was aggressive integration. And once the civil rights movement had been successful in 1964, he kept on pushing for equality. His last acts, his last speeches were against the massive discrepancy between black and white soldiers in the Vietnam War. He said, you know, they're sending our kids to die. You're not sending your own kids to die. What the hell is going on? People completely ignore that because they see him as this caricature, frankly, of uh, peaceful blackness that we can then hold up as a society and say, look how progressive we are. Whereas that's not historically not the case at all. And you see the similar things going on the memorialization of, of someone like Samuel Sharp in, in Jamaica or uh, Busa in, in Barbados. For a long time, they were seen as these, uh, these champions of peaceful protest uh, against slavery that were misunderstood by, by plantation owners. And they were not that at all. They were military leaders and strike uh, leaders of um, labor strikes against slavery because they were demanding uh, payment for their work, who were then violently uh, crushed by uh, a white um, a, a white imperial system desperate to silence that that kind of voice and I think that similar things might uh, could well happen now the I mean the distortion of kneeling in black lives matter I mean it, yeah. it in real time it, it changed it, its meaning changed uh, from you know protesting police violence to disrespecting the military which is Kaepernick explicitly said he was not doing well, you know, in, another one that I'm having a huge problem with mm -hmm. is um, January 7th was the the attack on the on the Capitol. Is that correct? January 7th? Six. Six. Right. Yes. And and this happens. And meanwhile, people like before that, prior to this, were having aneurysms practically mm -hmm. during during the NFL because people were kneeling to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. Like the 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 disparity between those two is baffling right and and it almost yeah. seems like you know it like and, and if you look at the people that stormed the capitol i mean the the demographics of which are quite telling i think that there's something strange going on here between you know again yeah. this the the psychology of 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 race in contemporary society and the imbalance yeah. of it. I mean, this this can't keep going on. I mean, because that's absurd that that this that it got to that level that that was able to happen. Yeah. And and I mean, and I, if and if the response was, I mean, the reality is, if if what happened on January sixth was of a different, um, you know, makeup, right? Mm -hmm. A different demographic, it would be a very different uh, uh, response. Yeah, I mean, this is this is garden variety racism on a on primetime TV, right? There's there's yeah. there's no there's no denying that the people who are, are screaming at, at black NFL players and um, suggesting that you know the 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 voices of January sixth were had legitimate grievances uh, and were responding appropriately is, I mean, yeah, the, I, there are roots historically, but I don't think you need to look at those to to know what you're looking at. In, in that particular instance, um, it does have a it does have a, a, a sort of an eerie echo of, of what happened in you know in light of industrial revolutions in the past. Uh, you know the, the genesis of that that kind of racialization, the the, the need and, and desire for elites whites to separate working classes by race uh, in order to ensure that they remain separate it is is really the genesis of something like that because you know the vast majority of those january the 6th rioters um you probably character characterize as as working class or perhaps middle class but certainly not elites um mm -hmm. by any stretch and and then the 
you know, the, the athletes kneeling are obviously making a huge amount of money, but they're representing a community that is extremely poor. Um, there was a very real fear that in the in the 19th century, post-industrialization, um, and in you know in the US and the U in Britain's case, post-abolition, that people of African descent and white working class people might recognize that they had uh, a lot more in common than not, and that they had grievances with all the same people. Uh, and that led to a racialization of uh, the labor force uh, and uh, created a sort of feedback loop of the reasons why poor white people were poor was because not all black people were poorer than they were. Uh, and that was, it was an easy thing to sell to a very, very desperate community um, who were hurting. Uh, and that is a, a playbook that is being repeated and repeated and repeated that, you know, the, historically what I'm talking about is the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, happens again uh, post-Civil War in the U.S. in the 1870s and 1880s when you have the Great Migration uh, North uh, and the, the urbanization and um, uh, increase in, in black urban communities uh, happens again during the Great Depression, the 1830s. That's a global thing um, where you have, again, a massive in, in, uh, urbanization in the Western world. Um, and a, a point to uh, people, communities of African descent and minority communities as well as the reasons why this is occurring. And then uh, 1970s, uh, same thing happens. 1980s, same thing happens. Uh, and now I think we're seeing it again. Um, it, it rears its head every generation or so uh, when when the, there's a need to remind communities of you know lie to communities as to why they're poor. And, and now it's manifesting itself in, uh, in gentrification, right? So these once poor neighborhoods, uh, now they're they're becoming like I, I live in Vancouver, and there's this place called uh, East Vancouver, and it's predominantly it's it's always been working class, but now it's like you know it's it's like a million dollars to buy an apartment down there, and it's like what it, it seems that this castigation is artificially managed like it's not a re it's not a real uh you know it's it, it's not really in nature it's it's maintained yeah i have a, a couple of colleagues who i always debate this with and they always tell me you know there's no dr evil behind the curtain managing all of this and you know it's not a, a single individual but it no it's been proved if you look at the manipulation of economic systems and the manipulation of communities that it's not actually that hard to maintain you know organized chaos in in that way uh, and and i think you're right gentrification is is a huge part of this um the the poor areas and you know my 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 most visceral experience is london um Southwest London, traditionally, when I, you know, even in my lifetime, has moved from being uh, a predominantly working class uh, and predominantly black area. Um, when I was about 10 years old, some artists started moving in because they liked the ambiance and they liked the graffiti. And then some more artists started moving in. And all of a sudden, those bedrock communities are being priced out of their own markets. And where are they going? They're going to the suburbs, where it's in London, it, it's a little cheaper to live further out of town. Those areas are predominantly poor white. And now these poor white people are faced with black people who have inner city paychecks are now being pushed out further. And they are pointing to these communities of African descent who are moving further and further out into these poorer, poor areas. And they are saying that it is their fault. Rather than seeing the, the what is in fact happening, you have middle class and upper middle class property developers coming in and artificially driving up the market price of the more central area. That's what's happening in London, and I'm sure that you could put a map on what's happening. Similar things happening in New York and in LA and in Vancouver, and uh, you know even in smaller cities. I live in Columbia, South Carolina, right now, and that's similar things are happening there. It's not that hard to see that. Um, you know, it only takes a few people to direct 
their investments in order to have a massive, you know, it's like it's the, the butterfly effect almost, a massive economic um, imp impact, and that leads to a massive geographic impact, which then leads to a, a massive racial impact. It, you know, it's, it's a pretty easy line to draw. What, you know, that is a really good point that you make. I mean, I don't think it's one, I don't believe in lizard people or anything crazy. No, like that, no of course, it's not obviously. That, but but, but what, I, what I do think is that, yeah, in, in order for politicians, I mean, there's so many intersections throughout history and society and all these things, right? And which makes it difficult because every single intersection has has the right to what they believe in, right? It, it, everybody has a right to life, has mm -hmm. a right to exist, as long as it, 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 it results in coexistence, of course, and not the removal of another party. But the problem is, is in these intersections, it can kind of, this is what I see, is that it puts us into different camps. And when we're in different camps, our power is divided in, in, in what it is that we want. And that's, you know, a coexistence, a peaceful coexistence. And I think that, again, I, I don't want to put a smoking gun in anybody's hands, but it does make it easier to sort of manage nations and states and governments mm -hmm. and things like that. If it's not, if it's you versus different groups versus you, the politician versus everybody, right? Yeah, you cut out for a second there. Do you, do you mind just repeating that last thing you said? Yeah, I was just saying that it's easier to manage something if it's if it's you versus a bunch of separate groups than it's you versus one collective. Yeah, and they, again, that, that, that's not something new. It, it, no. the the language we use is potentially is is certainly different, and the the makeup of those groups is is obviously different. But that you know, slavery was a tool of control and oppression as much as it was an economic, um, you know, a very powerful economic uh, force. Um, the notion of the empire uh, was a, a way of managing um, managing populations. Um, you know, mercantilism was both an economic system but also a social system of control. If you extract all the resources and, and wealth from one area, it's very unlikely that that area is going to be able to challenge you down the road. That, you know, it's called mercantilism in the early modern world. It was called, you know, economics. Uh, and, you know, and it, American imperialism today is, is doing similar things um, discursively, you know, and they don't need to roll in with tank divisions to be able to control somebody else's life. Uh, and and that's that's happening there, and it's it's happening, you know, it's happening the other side as well. You know what are, what are, what are Russians doing in in Crimea? That exact same thing. What are, what are the Chinese doing in the Uyghurs? The exact same thing. I'm not an expert in any of that, but it's it mirrors quite closely what I am an expert in, which is you know when when communities buck against those methods of control and and how the controllers respond and um, overcome these these challenges to their authority, which is usually, as, as we discussed with, with anti-slavery and abolition, it's usually incorporating and diluting that message uh, in order to take away the power, take away its power. Right, and, and it seems that a, an incredibly vicious tool, but racism, like, it, it seems that racism is, is again, it's almost like something that's a, a product of something else. Like, is are, are human beings innately prejudiced or is that idea put into them? Well, I don't know. That's, you know, that, that, there is no, I don't know about the innateness of it. Um, and, but I would say I would take it to a communal level, a, the level of the, a society or a state, and I would say no, that there, that is not innate uh, on that level. Um, my favorite example, when we, we talked earlier, we, I mentioned it, uh, is uh, Shakespeare's Othello. Um, the 1600s, 1500s, 1600s, you can have a black hero. Uh, that would have been while not 
may be expected, certainly accepted uh, by uh, the audience of the Globe or, you know, Stratford or, you know, wherever, wherever's playing Othello, uh, it would have been, and it was, received well and it was loved as a play. 200 years later, that doesn't, that's not possible. There, there's no black hero in Victorian literature. They, they are the heel, uh, they are the villain, uh, they are the incompetent sidekick at best. Uh, and that reflects an evolution in the place of race in English, British society. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with, as we, we started by discussing the Haitian Revolution uh, and the increase in the perception of Africans as savage. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the end of slavery uh, and the dictation of where people of African descent fit in society because they are no longer slaves uh, enslaved they they now have to be placed on on the ladder and of course they are placed at the bottom of that ladder and, and that's something that, that demonstrates that there is there is no innate prejudice uh, necessarily and yes individuals were prejudiced and um, it's I'm not by no means suggesting that in Shakespearean England it was in any way comfortable to be of African descent but it was in terms of the Africans' place in society, it was very, very different. Uh, and there was there was no large scale white supremacy, uh, to, to use that, that phrase, uh, in the way that there was come Victorian Britain uh, or, um, you know, and antebellum or even postbellum United States. Uh, they would have experienced a similar thing. There was no, no chance for someone who was not white to be uh, a, a heroic figure in, in society. Uh, there was the, you know, the othering, the, the presumed savagery, obviously you have Native American populations as much as uh, formerly enslaved population that fit into that. Um, but by that point, you have a, a, a society conditioned to, to see other and see uh, whiteness as superior. Which, which brings me to our next interesting point that, that we talked yeah. about and that's the role of the historian mm -hmm. so because we talked about like the you know hypotheticals and that's not the role of a real i try to avoid the word like real historian but the purpose of a historian i i, I love what you said i mean i don't want to take away your answer from you so what is the purpose no. of the historian so i think you know the the misconception is that it, it's about finding out things that happened in the past uh, and that is what what i do it is what we do but it's it's a means to the end because every we have to be conscious of filtering it through firstly our personal experience but also the world around us now yeah you know i study in slave rebellion because of you know my personal experience, my um, my mother's teachings, and my my growing up in in Brixton in London. But also, um, I wouldn't be writing what I'm writing had you know the the racial strife of the present day not been at the front and center of both my mind, but also a lot of other people's. Uh, and I would have led to it would have led to very different conclusions about the things that I did discover about the past because that interpretation is, is absolutely vital. And it, it what it's what separates, you know, the working historian from the person just reading about what happened. Uh, and, and I think it's an important skill. And I think it's, it's certainly something that society needs. I mean, obviously I would say that, but, but I think the ability to comprehend the, the history of current events by knowing more about the past is a very good way of, addressing and perhaps reconciling what is going on now. It's not to say that, you know, the, the, the old cliche is those who don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. And I, and I don't think that that's true, um, not only because no one's ever tried that, but also because it it's not like history has the answers. It Because as you said, it's not hypothetical. I don't think about what would happen had you know, had Toussaint Louverture not been quite so tactically astute, what would have happened in Haiti? Like, that's, it doesn't, it's not important. That's not what happened. happened. Yeah. It's yeah. not what happened, so it, it doesn't matter. Um, but 
I think that looking at the way that the voices of black people in even in moments of revolution when they were desperate for independence and end of slavery were silenced the fact that they were silenced has in part led to our present situation where we have societies who are communally and i mean in, in for a lot of people individually but certainly communally incapable of listening to people of African descent. And I think that, that that's not a new problem. And I think the fact that it's not a new problem should inform our response to it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there are so many problems that, that, I mean, once you start to sort of read about this stuff, you start to see it more. I, 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 I liken it constantly to the matrix. This idea of, you know, once you've seen it, you can't really unsee it. And even in the news, this idea of, it's almost like um, they paint it to be that all black people will vote Republican or all black people will vote Democratic. And it's like, that doesn't really, like, you're, you're putting everybody into a single category when you, when you speak like that. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, like you say, one of the ways to reconcile the past is to to teach it. And one thing that I've noticed in my, my own life now, I used to be a teacher is that we oftentimes don't uh, teach what we're uncomfortable, what we don't know. So we have to come from a place of being able to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but a place of humility, like this is what happened. I don't know a lot about this, but let's figure it out. Right. And I think that that can be empowering for students mm -hmm. because when I was a when I was a teacher, it was like, or excuse me, when I was a student, it was like the teacher knew everything, mm -hmm. and it was like to ask a question. It, it didn't really create a conversation, and I right. think that when you come from a place of like I want to know as well, that that can be empowering, it can mm -hmm. be enriching, and, and I think that that can sort of like you say reconcile because I, another thing is that. What what I think might be problematic is that if if I say okay, so Haitian history, uh, I I'm gonna, you know, I I'm gonna need a person of color to, in order to teach this, and I think that that can kind of again take away from it. It's like it should be, it should be me as well who's able to have this conversation in a way mm -hmm. that you know I I like I say I don't know, but at least I'm showing that and that that's okay for kids, for yeah. all people. So I think, yeah, I think this is, that's a, it's a huge debate in the historical arena, who is qualified to do what history. And right. it's, as you say, it, it would be absurd for only Haitians to, to, to cons only consider Haitians to be qualified to do Haitian history, only consider, you know, Brits to do British history. It, it, you know, firstly, what does it mean to be British? I'm, I'm British and my mother was like, you, know, you go back 50 years and neither parent was in Britain and I'm studying things that were 200 plus years ago. Am I qualified? Well, obviously I think I am. And uh, I mean, I am qualified, uh, but you know, there are people that might suggest, no, you're not, you, you, you haven't lived that sufficiently to be able to say that. But I do think, and I think your, what you said about comfort is really important. You know, you, you can't do it. You can't teach something you're not comfortable teaching. You can't research something you're not comfortable researching. Um, and, you have to be very honest with yourself about whether you are or aren't. Um, there are, you know, smaller topics that I have shied away from, um, you know, in my research because I'm not comfortable doing it. Not, not like, not emotionally, but I, you know, I, I try to avoid certain source bases because I'm not quite as comfortable interpreting them. Uh, as I believe I have colleagues who are. Uh, and so I, I tend to, you know, share my thoughts with them and, and let them uh, do the heavy lifting on that. Uh, I focus more on um, qualitative stuff, and, and but I know some, there are some phenomenal historians that do really wonderful things with, you know, data and, and statistics. I'm just not comfortable doing it, so I don't do it, and I'm not comfortable teaching it, so I don't teach it. But I'm comfortable, and I'm, I'm, I'm safe in the knowledge that there are people that are comfortable doing both of those things and therefore do it. Um, but I, I also know people who are not 
quite as honest with themselves about it and try and bite off more than they can chew. And, and, and that leads to bad teaching, bad research and, and miserable students who, who have a, a very, you know, a very disappointing outlook on what history does and what it can do. And, and I, so I agree. I think that the, the comfort level that the, the scholar has with the material is very, very important. Uh, and it's something that I, frankly, it is a new, it's a new debate in the, in the profession. Um, it, it's something that, you know, until recently, historians were taught to, to, to you know, as much as possible, remove themselves from the narrative. Um, not, not that I'm saying that you can only study what you have experienced, um, but remove your personal views and, uh, and approaches to things. And I think that that's actually really important and, 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 and writers and, and teachers and, you know, not, not just academics, but anyone that engages with information in any way should really ce celebrate the fact that they are putting their own spin on whatever they're reading and, and producing. Well, I, well I, we all have bias. Yeah, celebrate that. Yeah. Let, like, let's engage with the fact that that's a thing. It, it's not a bad thing. Don't uh, we say that. Like yesterday, the, the state of Florida just passed a law that made it illegal for uh teachers to teach anything in a biased way whatever whatever that means i don't know what that but that's means. impossible because well, you're taking yeah. away the 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 emotion from it right i mean yes. I, I this is what i think i think you need to identify your bias right well, which you need is, to be aware of what it is absolutely a hundred percent like but like you need uh, to use it too you could that's it's, all, it's a weapon in your toolbox that you can use to your advantage to both be a better scholar and a better teacher but engage students in a way that ordinarily it would they wouldn't be engaged with but you know everyone is aware of it if they just think for a second why they think the way that they think it's not a hard thing to access and it's not a hard thing to celebrate if you if you didn't have bias i mean i i i always like like you know we talk about the past and in mm. the future i i think i sometimes think of star trek as you know this this distant future where we can all just get along right right uh or, or that's that's the hope but if you didn't have bias, you would be like a Vulcan or something. You know what I mean? Like you, you wouldn't have attachment to what it is that you're studying. And part about life is that you do have some, some skin in the game, right? W which we've yeah. spoken about. I mean, that's what makes for, uh, I think, a, a riveting and, and a rich historical telling. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. But I think it, it goes bigger than that too. Mm -hmm. Because I think that people... You know, going back to, you know, put, putting this in the present day, but also historically, um, people need to recognize what their positions, how their place in life affects their positions on things. Uh, and I think that that's something that has been sorely lacking. And it, it's this, for too long, people have been told that bias is, is inherently negative and that you should approach things as evenly as you can rather than recognize and then celebrate your take on things that have happened. Um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, to take kneeling, uh, kneeling in football games is a good example of this. People are out, I'm not convinced that people are outraged because they are genuinely outraged. I think that they're outraged because they think that they should be outraged. <coughs> And that's a very different thing. It's no less real. I'm not suggesting that that outrage is not genuine, but it's not the same as as, as personal offence to an act. And that it, recognizing that would change the discourse. I'm not sure how, but it would, right? I I, I think too that with people who are upset about kneeling. It's to me, discomfort speaks to us. If, so, if I'm, if I'm, you know, if why am I, why am I being uncomfortable right now? I, mm -hmm. I think that that's a good, is it because I'm unprepared or is it because this clashes with something that I believe? And if right. so, why do I believe that? Right. So I think that the best thing to do, here's, here's what I think is kind of, you know, I'm going to tell you what I think is lacking in society as if I know, but it's our inability to have conversations between people of different opinions. 
right? It's this idea that somebody has to walk away being right. And the other person has to walk away being wrong. Yeah, I would take and, that a step further back, though. Well, I, I, I was going to say, I think we need to be able to understand each other. But please do take that a step further. I, but I, I think that the I, – I agree that that is – you know, that's a, a cancer on society that, that is running rampant. But I think the reason why is because I'm, I'm not I, I'm not sure we ever knew to, how to interrogate why we think what we think. So it's impossible to work out how to reconcile your views with another person's if you don't even know why you are holding the views that you hold. And, you, you, you know, people... People need to interrogate that further in order to to engage and you know, to bring it back historically onto firmer ground. For me, the, the imperial officials looking at enslaved rebellions were incapable of seeing other than a repeat of Haiti and working to stop that. The people who were rebelling wanted independence and an end to slavery and were willing to go to any means necessary to get that. Right. That is a discourse that was completely incompatible. And I think similar things are occurring now, but it, rather than because of there being a genuine, you know, an economic subjugation to engage with, that's a, that's a really short term and really quick way. Re, it's a really short term and really quick impossible reconciliation between an enslaved person and an imperial, uh, enslaved people and imperial officials. Right now it's a lot more nebulous, but you still have that Im impossible reconciliation. But I don't think we know why that is right now. And I think people must, communities need to look much more internally as to why that is in order to engage with the other side. I, I <laughs> I mean, there's so many different perspectives of looking through history. And one, one of my favorites is, is the Marxist-Leninist approach. I mean, and if you look to, again, what was the problem here is that the people who held the power, they were afraid that they were going to lose it, that their colonies, it would turn into another Haiti. God forbid that there's a black republic that they have to do uh, equitable trades with, you know, so that they don't just get the mass production. I mean, the, if, if, uh, yeah, you, sorry, I was going to go on a hypothetical there for a sec, but I no, stopped. Sorry. Myself. Anyways, but but what I th the point is is that even today, the real fear, like diversity and equality and inclusion, it's it's smoke and mirrors. You know what I mean? It's not real equity, like in terms of corporations and you know, dare I say, education, even entertainment. Mm -hmm. it, who really still holds all the power and that's what we need to look at right and, and i yeah. think that well i mean it's 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 an issue of scale right i it's quite easy for me to engage with you know diversity and inclusion in, in my personal life obviously i'm not white and i teach histories of race and slavery and that's quite a self-selecting group of students um <laughs> University wide, it's a little bit more difficult, but it, it, it is it's working on on university campuses. They they are they have a long way to go, but they're more diverse than they were 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And the corporate level, it's things are significantly better than they were in the past, right? But you're right. There, the notion that you can fix you know, you fix businesses and, and institutions. And then society will somehow follow. I, I agree with you. I think I'm a little suspicious that that's going to happen. Because I think people will, it'll end up being nine to five equality, which is not enough. And, and that is the, I mean, that's fertile ground for uh, historical revolutions. I mean, there's this idea of, th there's a theory that, um, rising expectations but then suddenly it stops people mm -hmm. are like hey you know there's there's more here i think that that's kind of what happened with like the russian revolution again I, 
I'm not an expert and I, I, I understand that's not exactly your field, but yeah, it's this, right. this, that we're still not there, right? There's still inequities. Yeah. It's that, like, yeah. How, how do we navigate that in the 21st century? And, and even just think, I mean, with the, with the printing press, the way that, that, that people were able to mobilize themselves now with the internet, I mean, you know, who knows what the next 20 years have in store for us? Yeah. And I think that that's, I think you, you sort of hit the nail on the head there that the, the problems are still not fixed. These are none of these are new problems. They are manifesting themselves differently because, you know, the internet is different to the printing press, but the, the disruptions it is causing are, are about the same. Um, the, slavery and the chattel industrial slavery does not exist anymore but the reasons why it occurred and the reasons you know mass exploitation for maximum economic gain are the same reasons as you have drastic inequalities going on in present day society and i think that people need to stop trying to you know people are pulling the weeds up but the roots are definitely yes, yes. still in the ground and as a as a society we need to stop being so shocked when the roots uh, when the, the weeds come out of the ground every once in a while because the we've not actually done anything about them uh, and you know and you know the uh, historians can highlight this and that's what we do uh we keep highlighting the fact that the roots are still there um but you know we are we are not tethered by the um practicalities of actually having to do anything about it you know we're not we're not the politicians we're not the business owners we're not the the leaders uh, uh, in society we are the observers of society and that can be very frustrating but it's also we have that freedom and we're, so we are able to to see those things in a way that people with responsibilities to do anything about it maybe can't right, right. That's, That's why, why I studied why I history uh, in university. <laughs> yes, because uh, it's true that we do need to question our perspectives. And I think that history does that when it's not imperial mm -hmm. history, you know, or, or imperial uh, empiricism. I forget. Um, Edward Gitt, he was the guy who wrote the, you know, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. But it was very yeah. one sided. And I'll never forget yeah. that. Uh, uh, I, I was in an indigenous uh, histories course, and this one lady said, "Why are we studying this? They were defeated." Yeah, right. And it's like, well, uh, like that encapsulates so many problems right there in that statement. Like, well, they were defeated. Why are we learning about them? Right. Yeah, and, and, I mean, and that is. That's what we, you know, like as a society, we need to ask ourselves, is that what we're saying is because this isn't relevant anymore? That's why we're not learning about it? Or, or excuse me, yeah. because this isn't happening right now. This is why are we learning about this? When really yeah, it, I, it, it's echoes. It, it, yeah, it's echoes. That Why aren't we learning about it? Why aren't we learning from it? Is I think those are the two, those are the two sort of, rhetorical gripes that I have, you know, the frustrations, mm -hmm. um, it, it should, it, it's obvious to me, but then I've been training for this for, you know, a very, very long time. So of course it's obvious to me, um, that, you know, I, I, I study a rebellion in modern day British Guyana and I see parallels with what is going on in London in 2020. Well, yeah, of course I would, wouldn't I? Cause I'm from London and I'm, I'm an expert studying this sort of thing. So, you know, the patience is obviously important with this, but at, at the same time, whoever this person was is, is obviously wrong. Oh, <laughs> being right, being right. defeated is, is not a precursor to forgetting. And, you know, living in the United States South, sometimes I wish that were the case but for the the vast majority of the time it, it it's the, the why were they defeated is would be my next question 
and then the one after that. But how does that manifest today? Were they really defeated? Are they all gone? Or, uh, you know, uh, is Canada wrestling with its relationship with First Nations to this day? And looking at the news right now, um, they very, very, very much are. So I think it's very important to, to look at the origins of that, not not to suggest that it would ever happen again. I think that it wouldn't. But I think it understanding its roots would be very beneficial to modern day relationships. In, and I think that, that that would be repeated in the United States. It would be repeated in Britain. In Britain, last couple of months ago, commissioned this a report on, on racial equality in Britain. And it concluded that there was no systemic racism in the UK, which is utter nonsense. And I denounced it and my colleagues denounced it and the United Nations denounced it. Um, and you, all you need to do is, you know, read my work and read other people's works. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm by no means the authority on this, but even me, lowly me, would be able to tell you the reasons why it was nonsense. Uh, and it wouldn't have taken very long to read my catalogue and there were, people far smarter than me who would take a lot longer, but you'd all reach the same conclusion uh, that there are very re- very real historical reasons why systemic racism does exist in the UK, and this report willfully ignored those to come to its conclusion. Right. Well, I mean, that's, that's it right there. Uh, th- there's an episode that uh, I'll have to share with you, but it's with this guy who he was like, oh, you're talking about Jamaica. And I was like, well, but you have to understand the history of, of how any, we have to understand, like, we don't just appear somewhere. We get right. there. Everybody gets to where they're going. And that's why history is important is we can understand where we're coming from and ultimately where we're going, where we're headed. And, and like you've said, I mean, that, that echoes until today. So um, for yourself, What's what's next ahead? I mean, you said that you're moving to the University of Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So I'm starting there in the fall. Um, hopefully, uh, publishing a, my book. Uh, it's still in pieces, um, but it's it's a book about uh, enslaved rebellions, um, looking at you know not looking at Haiti, but looking at those that came after Haiti. Uh, and the ways that the Haitian Revolution was repeated in them, and then how Brit- the British Empire responded to them. Uh, and my, I argue that it, they crafted a new form of racism uh, without slavery by co-opting the, the messages of enslaved people uh, and distorting them after the fact. Uh, and I project that forward um, to to the night, uh, the two 2020, to the, the the marches, the George Floyd protests that happened in London, mm-hmm. to point out that um, people of African descent have a community outside the modern nation, uh, and that's you know the the the, the tragedy of, of, of people of African descent anywhere affects people of African descent everywhere, and how modern states, because of their inherent racism, are, are, are not able to comprehend that or address it. In your studies, which by the way, you have to send me a copy of this book when it's done, and I'll, I'll have you back. Probably, on. But yeah, I certainly will. <laughs> um, but in your studies, what was the bit like? Did you have an aha moment, like your biggest takeaway from everything that you've learned in the in the course of? I I forget how many years was it? Is it fifteen years that you've been been building? studying this? Yeah. Um, this project I've been doing for seven, um, but I've been, you know, since I started my formal studies, it's been 13. Yeah. So it's been a while. Um, I think it, I was very reluctant to insert my personal narrative into the process. Um, and, you know, I, I don't write about my mother and I don't write about my upbringing. But I was very, I was very reluctant to allow that to seep into my analysis and, and seep into my writing. Uh, and it was a, it was a, it was about, yeah, probably four years ago when when I I just I finally just let that start happening. Uh, I, you know, I, I re- re- 
relented to myself uh, and, and just accepted that it was actually, it was inevitable. Uh, and it quickly became absolutely vital. Uh, and it allowed me, it, it opened so many analytical doors for me, uh, being able to, you know, look, use that lens, the lens of my own understanding of race uh, and, and the place of being non-white in, in British society suddenly allowed me to read into the documents that I was looking at, um, you know, the court records and private letters and testimonies and, and diaries uh, from enslaved people and people who were around enslaved people suddenly just took on a whole new meaning um, by being able to filter it through the present state of race relations in Britain, which was how I used my my personal upbringing. And, that, and, that, and you know, as I said, the role of the historian is to, to understand it through the present. There's no way I could have understood what I was looking at to the degree that I do without doing that. So you were able to place yourself in history. I, I was able to place people like me in the history. Um, you know, I, I wasn't there and I didn't experience it as an individual, but I have family members who experienced it and, and ancestors who experienced it. You know, my, my, mother's, my mother's ancestry is enslaved. Uh, people in in South Africa, uh, and so I I could tap into you know uh, an actually quite visceral um, communal memory in order to understand things going on in in the Caribbean. Is is, is your mother is your still with us? No, she passed a, a few years ago, um, but she told me well. And and she knew that you were you know taking on this undertaking and. Oh yeah, yeah. No, she she definitely encouraged me. She was a she was a teacher herself. She taught art and art history um, at the, at high school level, uh, and so was was obviously quite quite biased, but celebrated that bias by encouraging me to to go into similar into a similar field. Um, and she was she was adamant that we, me, and my my brother and sister, um, learned our past and learned to understand our present through that past and i just i'm putting it on a, a bigger scale um but it worked but as i said i was reluctant to do that I, it felt mm -hmm. exploitative uh for a very long time i wanted to be a, a little further back and a, away from it and realizing that that was both impossible and counterproductive was the only way that i i was able to do that awesome. well uh, dr uh, Lewis Elliott, thank you so much no thank you for having me this was this was awesome well, I, I'm going to have to have you back on and uh, just do it. For sure. Hopefully before that book comes out, because if it's coming out 2025, I mean, I don't know if I can yeah. wait that long. Well, I'll, 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 I'll rush if I can, but you know, <laughs> the, the editing process is slow, both on my end and, and the presses. So, um, is it, Now, are, is this, is this going to be like a popular history book? Like a, like almost like a now Ferguson kind of level or no, uh, <laughs> I, I so I, I like to think that I write excessively. I mean, you can you can be you can agree or disagree with that. Um, I agree. But you know, there there is a professional requirement to own your chops, and and that means university press first. The next book maybe will be if if I if I, look if I have Niall Ferguson's career, I'll, I'll be very very happy <laughs> with myself. Well, thank you so much, and um, really. Thank you for uh, for your time and your insight. No, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, yeah, for sure. Again, again, if you want me, I'll be. That was great. I do. There's your answer. So, thank you. Awesome. All right.